Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for details, documentation, and denials in hospice clinical records. My name is Megan Henry, Marketing Communications Manager for Healthcare First, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items to make sure your webinar experience is a good one. You've joined today's webinar listening through your computer speaker system by default. This means if you can hear music through your computer, you will be able to hear the presentation. If you would like to call in using your telephone, just locate your audio pane and select Use Telephone. The dial-in information and access code will then be displayed. You have the ability to ask questions using your questions pane. Simply type in your question and click Send. We will try to do a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. However, it is jam-packed. We've got a lot of things to cover, so we may not get to them. However, please feel free to ask the questions and we can get back to you. The handout for this webinar can be obtained through GoToWebinar. Just locate your handouts pane in the control panel and select the file for download. You can then click the downloaded file to open or save it. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded and we will distribute the recording to attendees following the webinar. All right, before I turn this presentation over to Loris, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about who we are and why we do what we do. It all started nearly 25 years ago with a vision to deliver innovative, easy to use and affordable solutions that enable home health and hospice agencies to put patients before paperwork. And to this day, that vision has never changed. We work hand in hand with more than 4,000 agencies just like yours each and every day to understand your unique needs and deliver the solutions you need to succeed. On the next slide, you can see that we offer a number of affordable solutions designed to help your agency maximize your profit, ensure regulatory compliance, and provide quality patient care. This includes First Hospice, our EHR software, coding services, billing services, CMS submission of hospice item set data, CAT surveys, and advanced clinical, financial, and executive analytics. You can pick and choose those solutions that you need now, add more later, or choose to partner with us for our solution suite, which combines all of these products and services into one total agency management package. If you're interested in learning more about how Healthcare First can help you strengthen profitability, ensure compliance, and improve quality, fill out the survey that pops up at the end of the webinar and let us know. We are very excited to have with us today Loris Balamic. Loris is a nurse consultant specializing in education and mentoring for staff providing services in hospice, palliative, home care, and assisted living. Loris's 40 plus years of experience in clinical practice spans intensive care, outpatient services, and 19 years as the founder and director of a Medicare certified home care and hospice agency. For the past 13 years, Loris has provided consulting services through Loris Consulting LLC. Now I would like to turn the presentation over to Loris. Thank you so much and welcome to everyone. And as was discussed and you downloaded your slides, you can see we have a lot of information to cover today. And hopefully it will be helpful to you, specifically the handouts that would, I believe, be good tools to take back to your individual staff. You, you can read the objectives as stated here, but I'd like to just state up front, wow, we could spend a week talking about documentation for hospice because it's everything from the HIS and how we bill and the individual chart and all of those kinds of things. So I will try to focus on one aspect today and that will be the individual documentation by your clinicians and volunteers. Long past are the days in which, as I grew up with hospice back in the 19, late 1989, 90, you know, we got a diagnosis from the physician, a primary diagnosis. We didn't even really care how the accurate the coding was. And we just went ahead and started to provide care. Well, those days are long gone, distant past, and we know that every single part of the record and the chart, when requested by CMS, is looked at specifically for documentation to decline or discharge, et cetera. I've included a slide here for those of you that might want to go back and you do want to really think about your team that may not understand the acronyms that clinicians sometimes rattle off very quickly. So this is just a short list of many kind of three and four 
digit acronyms that might be helpful to you. So what I'd like to talk about initially is the fact that it, our documentation always needs to be authentic. It needs to be by, written by the person who did the work. I still find sometimes people will say, well, this person didn't get to document, so I left a little space on the chart and then, you know, I, I wrote in the note or it was a late entry. No, it needs to be authentic. It needs to be provided by the person. We need to have signatures and disciplines and dates, like all good legal documentation. I'd like to suggest that concise is more often better than long rambling narrative. And you're going to hear me talk about that a bit. I would suggest that occasionally you print out your software produced document if you're on software and look and see how interested you would be in reading the report. I think when we can pick out certain, you know, is it a, an objective, a, a goal of the patient, what was the intervention, what was the outcome, and then we discharge, if you will, the focus or the problem and we move on, really helps paint the picture. Reading long rambling narratives really doesn't do anybody any good and it doesn't keep us on focus. So sometimes more is not always better. Our documentation needs to be objective. We need to ditch the drama and the trauma and stick to the facts. We need to have comprehensive but pertinent documentation and it needs to be consistent throughout our agency. For example, the assessment tools that we're using. Does everybody know how to use them? Are we charting? Are we using them appropriately? Do we need to change it out, et cetera? And of course, our documentation needs to be timely. We want to do a self-check to say, you know what, can the reader visualize the patient and the family? Put you know, three charts down and say, can I pick up the, one of them and go to the patient's home or room and say, yep, this is the patient they're talking about. Does it reflect the disease progression, demonstrate the need for interventions, and of course, all of that good objective data that we'll talk about a bit later? What are you using within your agency to measure what it is that you're looking at? For example, if you're doing mid-arm circumference anthropomorphic measures of the um, arm, are you noting which arm? Is the patient sitting or standing? Do you have uh, points in which are you are you measuring you know from the shoulder to the elbow and is it midpoint is everybody doing it the same what kind of descriptors are you using and in the handout that I gave you today I have included as many as I could find descriptors of ways that we could be more specific with verbs with adjectives that describe what our what we see with our patients. And are we including applicable criteria from the local and the national coverage determination guidelines that leads us in our documentation? So for example, I'll just give you to kind of whet your appetite, this would be inconsistent documentation when the nursing note says non-ambulatory and the chaplain says walked around the hall. Well, we can see we have a big, you know, non, you know, we have a conflict here. Well, maybe the chaplain's note needed to have said, walked around the hall or push the Broda chair and walk the halls, but the patient was sitting in the Broda chair the entire time. So while we mean to chart well, and it's not inaccurate charting, it's incomplete charting. And that alone can be enough, quite honestly, I've seen it, in which a chart is requested as an ADR requesting additional information in which we can be, if you will, charted out of eligibility for that hospice patient. And certainly you can appeal it and appeal it and whatever it is to get all the way up to the administrative law judge, but that's a lot of time and energy on your agency's part. So let's talk about when do we start the documentation? Well, I'm gonna suggest from the get-go, the minute we hear the phone call, we get an email, we have a fax that comes through, we have family that stops in our office to do an inquiry. That is the start of our documentation. So look at your referral forms. What are you asking upon intake? I put quotes from patients and families on that referral form. Think about everything that you are getting in which you're already starting to formulate your opinion of further questions to ask. And this might be the triggers you would call, call. Was there a recent hospitalization? Is it a new diagnosis? Is it metastases of an existing diagnosis? Had it been a change in the goals of care? I was continuing with, but now I'm not. And I wanna discuss what hospice can do for me. Did the physician or the nurse practitioner just round at the nursing home? Sometimes that's enough to stimulate the trigger. And then I say, well, so what about that nursing home round? 
caused or initiated this contact? Was there a weight loss? Well, how much and how recently? Was it an unintended weight loss or was it due to the fact that we finally had some compliance or diuretics on board? Have there been recurrent infections? You know, I'd like to remind myself and all of us, infections are not normal. So if we have recurrent infections, how frequently, what did we do about it, et cetera? Has there been an exacerbation of pain, therefore a change in medications perhaps? Is it a call because of caregiver burnout? Uh, we know 35% of our patients die within seven days, so we might be getting those very last minute and unfortunately phone calls of caregiver burnout. Is it because folks are looking for financial relief of the cur current treatment and care, et cetera, or it might be, can you help me with a healthcare directive? So whatever it is upon referral, get that into the documentation. It becomes also an excellent tool at the end of the year or every six months in which administration is looking at all these pending referrals. Why did we not admit? Were they out of geographic area? Did they die before they were admitted, et cetera, et cetera. Also to include any discussions you've had, which I hope you have in some fashion with your hospice medical director, who is your gatekeeper and your attending physician. While they don't need to talk face to face, there better be some strong documentation as to who did we clear this admission with? and not just say, well, I took a call and it looks like imminent death, et cetera. We want to document really well upfront. And we know CMS is going to be in 2018 looking at that initial referral for eligibility. We also document during the time of the election of benefit. You know, what discussion, what, what kind of information did we share with the client during that time, et cetera. And then also, you know, the cert certification of terminal illness the physician's narrative being created by your medical director. And that is so key in regards to good, good narrative. It's suggested that your medical director be the one that construct the narrative because you're teaching and training just as a surgeon needs to document really well why they're going to do surgery and what they're planning for insurance to cover that, so do we in hospice. And so that narrative, that very intentional, in-depth narrative, I cannot stress that enough. Not only at certification, but also at recertification. And then another list, of course, your ongoing assessments from any one of your interdisciplinary team members. Think about your hospice aid and volunteer assignment sheets. They should be changing in nine months and 10 months if your client is declining. I go back and look at those upon survey and say, wow, it's the same as when that client was patient was admitted. And yet I'm seeing in the nursing record that they're more dependent on ADLs, but we haven't updated our assignment sheet. Our coding and our billing, is that reflective of not only the primary terminal, but the comorbidities and was it updated when perhaps the primary terminal changed? And then during our face-to-face, -face, the good narratives that are collected. And then upon recertification, and don't forget about your communication notes and your logs. Sometimes we don't think about how important that is, but when the patient and or family is calling after hours and saying, this is going on, you know what, we wanna capture that. Or the water cooler talk, the care planning that goes on between staff members. So our first goal is really to support the presumption that the patient is terminally ill, that they have a medical prognosis of a life expectancy of six months or less. The second goal is to describe their condition. And the third is to prove that the care we're providing is applicable and appropriate to meet their needs. And the fourth is to document the patient narrative. And I'm gonna suggest not in this particular order, but sometimes it starts with the narrative. The patient who says, you know what? I don't think I'm doing so well. I don't think I'm gonna make it through this. I'm not sure my doctor is telling me what I want to or not want to hear, et cetera. I put those kinds of things in quotes. So your hospice medical director's role is they didn't just sign up for this because nobody else wanted the job. This is a very crucial part of your hospice team and program. The responsibilities not only by CMS, but also by your state licensure indicate, you know, this is your go-to person who helps determine, that's their training, the prognosis, diagnosis. Looking at the record review 
having the discussions with other physicians, the attending, and then also what is the clinical judgment. Uh, certainly that comes with experience and you know what there's nothing that would exclude your request of your medical director to go examine the patient because perhaps it's iffy and you decide you know what we really like an exam here or we're not sure if we should accept this patient. It is part of the job of your medical director and attending to determine the diagnosis and describe it in the narrative. So one of the things you want to do is look at the history and physical. And granted, you may not have it on day one, but I suggest you talk about that on day one to say, you know, it would be extremely helpful if you could fax us the H&P prior to, because we're gonna need all this information. It's kind of like I don't roll up to the emergency room and say, admit me to the hospital. There's a lot of work that happens in the ER that is, you know, looking at my situation, is it best treated as an inpatient, or, you know, can I go home? Well, it's no different in hospice. So we want to say from that H&P, is there something we can, if you will, sleuth out? It's kind of like forensics, I might suggest, in which is there evidence of end-stage disease? What's the onset, the exacerbation? What's been the course of illness? What's happened in the last six months, the last year, et cetera? And if the patient is not eligible, then don't admit. Or if during the time they're in our program and they become ineligible, we need to discharge. I would say this, you know, we do need to have our patients demonstrate decline to stay in the program. But then we also say, okay, here is their primary terminal illness, but what about the other comorbidities? What is related? And in what I hear, what I read from CMS and our national organizations, there's pretty much not too many diseases that are not related in some fashion and lend itself to the declining prognosis of the primary terminal illness? And is the treatment beneficial within that patient's expected uh, life expectancy? And should we look at discontinuing some of, if, if you will, the medications and the treatments the patient is on? And then also when we have that opportunity to see the patient for the first time, we wanna put our whole senses on. I'd like to say be cognizant of my eyes, my ears, my nose, what am I hearing, what am I sensing, etc. What do I feel? What is the family telling me? What do I need to explore further? For example, if I walk into the room, I might say that I might observe that the patient is trying to put food in his mouth, but most of it ends up all over his face and shirt. The shirt is soiled with dried food. Isn't that an observation I want to record? Or the patient is sitting in the wheelchair, leaning to the left, drool is running constantly, continuously down his mouth, soaking the pillow, unable to hold his head up. And would that be important to put in my record if the patient has Parkinson's, excessive secretions, maybe there was difficulty in swallowing, loss of mu muscle function? I am supporting the diagnosis with what I'm observing. So we know Medicare coverage depends on that physician certification that an individual's prognosis is a life expectancy of six months or less. And the LCD, the NCD, describes the guidelines to be used in reviewing the hospice claims. So not only should we be looking at our Medicare administrative contractors' guidelines that they have pulled from the national guidelines, we want to look at that for eligibility and for continued recertification. These are the same guidelines our max use to either uh, pay our claims or not when they're looking at our record. So as we know, we can go to the website. I just happened to pull up um, National Government Services here because I'm most familiar with this MAC living in Minnesota. And we see we have the local coverage determination guideline. And so if I go down this, I am going to see listed on this page and I print it out for all the clinicians the guidance for end-stage heart disease, lung, kidney, liver, ALS, Alzheimer's, cancer, et cetera. And so if I get a referral for end-stage heart, I'm going to look at that guideline. And it's going to state that, you know, the PPS, the palliative performance scale, probably needs to be 70% or less. I need to think about that person having a class four in the New York heart um, indexing which means they have disabling dyspnea at rest. They have complaints of pain. 
And so if I know this guidance, when I then go to view my patient and do my assessment, I'm going to be specifically focusing on what kinds of symptoms might they have that I should be, have my ears on for. But as you can see, not every disease that causes a terminal illness is listed in our local coverage determination guidelines. So we also have this other whole section that talks about, okay, then we better capture decline, worsening symptoms, you know, increased dependency on ADLs, and then we have a whole list of comorbidities that we want to think about. I would like to suggest that, you know, when supporting a prognosis, it isn't always the number of comorbidities that we pull forth, but the severity of those comorbidities. So if we have a comorbidity that adds to the primary diagnosis of, let's say, lung cancer, but we also have congestive heart fail, failure, boy, am I going to pull through that chart. Anything I can upon the comorbidity, congestive heart failure, that adds to the prognosis of the lung cancer. And so again, think outside, if you haven't already, think outside the box of every single disease that is known to this patient. And then be sure that your staff, your clinicians understand that if this is our primary, if, if you will, our Northern Star, this is what we then need to think about charting to. And then when we go into the whole assessment piece, we look at, you know, what do our staff know? What these acronyms mean? Do they truly know how to use the PPS and the KPS, the FAST, et cetera, and the stages of congestive heart failure and Alzheimer's. Have we done any inter-rater reliability? So when the same person does it, two different individuals go out and do a PPS evaluation, would they get the same percentage? And I have listed for you here, I, we don't have time today, but I've just listed some other assessment tools that you and your agency might entertain as, again, um, validated instruments in which you're gathering this good information. You know, some of you use the Edmonton symptom assessment because it goes through a lot of different symptoms that include some that I have listed here. But we want to be sure that, again, we are using the appropriate assessment tools. We want to show that there's evidence of end-stage disease and look at objective evidence clinical values, including lab x-ray findings, trials and side effects of attempted interventions. Somebody that's on a very low dose furosemide, I might question, how can they be an end-stage end -stage congestive heart failure? And then I go back and look at the record and I say, wow, they failed the trials, if you will, because they were symptomatic with inotropes or calcium channel blockers or, and this is as good as it gets. I'm gonna pull that forth in the record because we need to show that they've had optimal interventions and perhaps had then the side effects from them. So we know that sometimes it's going to be, we're gonna to have to demonstrate what is the perfect fit. Wow, they meet the LCD guideline for Alzheimer's. Or we might have the patient who, it's a guideline, they almost meet it, but not quite, but wow, do they have significant comorbidities? Or it might mean the person, well, they almost meet it, but wow, are they declining fast? And then sometimes it's clinical judgment, and then you want to chart to clinical judgment. So it's really finding the perfect piece, knowing, again, these are guidelines. I've already mentioned this. Just be sure your visit notes based on the scope of that assessment, be it the nurse, the social worker, the therapist, PTOT speech, what are we expecting to be included in that clinical note? And does it then go refer to the goals of our care? Does it all tie together? So I'm looking at the ADLs of our patients. Are they declining? I love to go actually look at my patient in the nursing home while they're being fed or they're in activities, they're in the dining room or in my assistant livings or around mealtime when I'm visiting somebody in their home. How is it going? Is it taking longer for that person to eat and to chew, etc.? And what are they doing in regards to their ADLs and care? And also as persons decline, they may need that walker, that wheelchair. Think about doing some, if you will, referrals to PTOT or speech, discipline appropriate, in which they come in and and then do instruct for that next stage. This is how you appropriately use the wheelchair. This is how you transfer. 
this is how you manage and conserve energy, that can add, not from a rehabilitative standpoint, but that can add to your chart to say, wow, we had another intervention here because of the decline. We also want to chart what else is going on. Psychosocially, emotionally, has there been a change in the environment? What is going on spiritually with the patient, as you well know? We again want to be able to go back to quantify the changes by time frames of that decline. What kind of symptoms has the patient experienced? Again, I can't emphasize enough. Putting things in quotes can be very helpful. How, has, how have they quantified? Despite our you know, oxygen saturations, if the patient says they're short of breath, you know what, they're short of breath, and I'm going to start documenting how quickly did they recover after an activity, et cetera. So then we also want to look at the collaboration between the interdisciplinary team, because you know a lot goes on behind the scenes, and take credit for it, because you know that's part of your intervention, and you wouldn't be doing it if the patient truly didn't decline and needed a new intervention. Documenting your unplanned care, your unplanned phone calls, your visit, the patient's visit to the ER helps paint the picture. And then what about all of these A's and then we throw in the laxatives, the analgesics, the changes you've made in medications and for what, and anti-emetics and the anti-anxiety and anti-psychotics. Provide that more than just kind of your doctor's order. Bring that forth in your IDT notes to say, you know what, we've had to make these changes because there is a worsening condition. So your notes should address the list here. Severity, I know I've talked about this before, but the physician assessment, the reason, the rationale for orders and changes in medication. Sometimes I see orders that say, you know, let's give an anxiolytic or give, uh, let's just say an opioid for shortness of breath or anxiety. Wow, let's narrow that down. Why? Is it really shortness of breath we're treating or is it anxiety? And let's then monitor it effectively to be sure that we know why somebody is receiving the medications. Ongoingly, we want to chart any changes in cognition. The max, I've already talked about, dyspnea, medication adjustment, responses to interventions, quote from patient and family, compare and contrast. I know some of the software systems do an excellent job pulling that forward so we really can say, wow, a month ago, this is what we saw. Now we see this, that is invaluable in regards to noting that in your conversation. So what's the big problem? Well, here's a short list. Our notes don't reflect the presence of symptoms. We have conflicts between clinicians. We have conflicts in our uh, charting, if you will. Or we might be using these, I'm gonna call them bland adverbs. Patient is stable, there's no change. How about this one? No evidence of disease. Well, that would just about chart you right out of coverage, if you will. They're doing well. So we want to think about things like when we're ever using this, we want to talk about when they, we observe them eating well. We want to say as evidence by they're holding the, their spoon because their pain is better managed or we've provided them with an adaptive device. So when we say the patient is more short of breath, compared to what? They continue to decline compared to what? They're weaker. How do we know they're weaker? They appear to be losing weight. How do we know that? We might say, as evidenced by, you know, they demonstrate increased shortness of breath as evidenced by respiratory rate averages 32 to 36 breaths per minute as compared to 24 to 28 last minute with increased use of oxygen from two to three liters last month, now we've increased it. So again, quantify it. Patient has lost five pounds from the last CERT period, now weighs X, Y, Z, is refusing oral intake and tube feedings. That helps create a picture. So here I just have an example for us in which the patient had a diagnosis of some kind of dementia. And the nurse's note said they had a fast score of 7D while the social worker documented the patient was in the activity room putting a puzzle together. Really, if I look at a 7D, there is no way that patient who's un, unable to speak in more than five or six intelligible words is probably putting a puzzle together. But when the social worker was questioned and interviewed, she said, well, it wasn't exactly that case. I held the patient's hand over hand and helped put the puzzle piece in the correct place. So when that happened, 
the note could have read, they were so disoriented that she needed hand over hand assistance to pick up the puzzle piece and to place it in the appropriate place. So that definitely gives us a bit more information. The next one is another succinct example that you can take back and use to give us an idea of how as clinicians we really need to be charting. We want to also then be able to chart in a way in which we're reflecting positive results from our intervention. You know, the patient's acceptable pain level, they said, I'd like a two and always include your scale, zero to 10, or is it zero to five, or is it a verbal descriptor, et cetera. They were, were able to reach that accepted level of pain with the addition of MS cotton, Roxanol. The patient expresses their ability to spend time with the family on the sun porch as desired. Here's another one. Respiratory symptoms were abated with the medication regime. Effectively using positioning techniques taught by nurse, you know, use terms that reflect the positive nature and effect of your hospice team, even if it's temporary in, you know, in any way. And then follow through to say, and despite this patient continues to still decline. So you're not withholding the positive results of your intervention, you're stating them out loud but then you're also stating how does that look when we step back. You know, we can't just keep people on hospice because they're nice people or, well, if we weren't there, they would decline faster. Medicare doesn't write us a check for that. So again, every note, every time, we need to think about how are we documenting. And our documentation must stand alone when we think about recertification. If we receive this referral today, would we enroll them? and what would bring us to that um, decision. So again, we wanna capture that. So we go back and we say, what were they on admission? What were they 60 days ago? Can we bring any of that nature forward? Because again, the patients, excuse me, Medicare, they do not see the hospital records. If there was a hospitalization in between that time, they don't pull that forward and say, okay, now this happened unless it was a GIP. So we need to be very clear as to why we are planning to recertify them or if in fact we're not. And we've had 60 to 90 days to gather information. Does the record, not just does Loris think this person should be recertified, does the record reflect this patient has declined? What are the new symptoms? What are the new treatments? And also vulnerability from a legal standpoint and from a hospice reimbursement. If we have incomplete assessments, if we fail to document, if we have this positive sort of rhetorical kind of charting, uh, what a great job the staff is doing, cute little patient. That really doesn't add to our documentation. If we have incorrect dates, diagnoses, missing signatures, what about no discipline after our signatures? We need authentication of every single note. And please, please, I'm gonna beg you, do not do can charting. Our software system sometimes, it, it can be very tempting to just go check, 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 check you know what, then everybody sort of looks the same. So think about ways that you can add to what it is your software is doing. And I'd like to suggest, don't let our software systems, if you will, guide our practice. Let our practice guide how we use our software systems. So we also, the risk of denial, if for the patient who doesn't have cancer, who has been in our program greater than 180 days, if we've inappropriately used general inpatient um, in, uh, in admission, there we got the word, or it's an imp inappropriate use of continuous home care. Um, certainly it has to be crisis driven for both GIP or continuous care. There's a non-measurable rate of progression or there's a higher than average rate of revo revocation. That's another whole story. Why is that person revoking the benefit or a higher than average number of discharges. And of course, CMS is watching all of this because we give them all the data. So if they're not terminal, not eligible, we need to discharge. Shouldn't be a surprise to the team nor to the family because they need time to prepare. And I've given you just a couple examples of how you might document in your record what it is that maybe two weeks prior to discharge you want to think about. If eligibility is questioned, if the patient continues to respond and they don't experience an exacerbation, we may think about discharging. And then you talk about that at that next interdisciplinary team meeting. You also know you follow your discharge plan as to 
what is required, how much notice is given, what do you need to give some time state guidance, also says you need to give a bill of rights again, et cetera, et cetera. So be sure that you understand what documentation needs to be in place. And also, if the patient and or family appeals your decision, you're gonna need strong documentation from a compare contrast basis to say, why did we discharge? Because you know, in fact, here's the numbers that show the improvement. So now I'm gonna go a little bit into what I feel needs to be documented for the different four levels of care. As you can see from the NHPCO information uh, collected for us and published, the majority of the time our patients are in the in-home benefit, which is not a surprise to any of you on the phone. So what do we do? We are gonna document supporting information from our visits, as I've suggested. The trajectory of the terminal illness, most of the time you have that well under your belt. But of particular risk, as I mentioned, is the documentation for continuous home care. So we really wanna say, why now? When, what have we tried? You know, what is the login time? We need to be sure we know how many minutes to the 15 minutes we are providing care. As you know, we document, it's encouraged that we chart every hour, the response, the intervention, the management during the crisis care, all the communication we've had with the physician. While it's not required to seek a physician's order to change to different levels of care, it's my best advice to you to seek an order because it also does two things. It backs you up and it also documents your communication with that physician on a change in the plan of care. And then also you're gonna to wanna to document your discharge plans because you're not gonna keep somebody in continuous care for longer than that crisis has become evident. Active dying is not a reason for somebody to be in continuous care. So again, special attention to detail. Also the documentation that needs to happen during general inpatient. And this is really services provided level of care to provide pain and symptom management keywords that cannot be provided in any other setting. This is not about, well, we couldn't find a nursing home that would accept this patient because they had an IV running. That's not reason for GIP because other nursing homes may take that person with an IV running. Maybe they just didn't have a bed. So we need, it's not about the place the person is receiving the care, it is about the level of care they need. So we may need to leave them in that general inpatient unit until we can find another space, but we can't bill Medicare if it is not crisis. So we expect to see documentation of medication adjustment, other stabilization for that treatment, supporting documentation that the family who might be providing skilled services at home because they have, happen to have a nurse, you know, and just says, I can't do this anymore. We need to have this inpatient admission. And as those of you on the phone well know, any place we contract for either respite or general inpatient does need to be Medicare certified. So that would be the nursing home, or it could be a Medicare certified residential hospice per se. And so my contracts would reflect what it is that I expect of GIP. And I also want you to think about maybe it would be beneficial for you to ask for copies of the general inpatient stay, specifically copies of medication changes, of the MAR, of the nurse progress notes, of physician notes, et cetera. It's also been recommended that uh, we document heavily the precipitating event. What did we try before we resorted to GIP? And again, I've given you a list here and thank goodness we have GIP um, you know, contracts. And I, I think we're also suspect if we never use them, but we have fractures that we can't deal with anywhere else. We have terminal agitation, bowel obstructions, et cetera. It is also advised that perhaps your NP or your MD make visits to the GIP. And this was something that has just been shared from um, conferences at a national level because of the scrutiny. And so you look back at that, but at a minimum, you would want somebody from your hospice team to make visits to your gen general inpatient setting, to look at the chart, to talk with the staff, to start your discharge planning, et cetera. So this is what we would expect to see during that GIP stay. When all, sometimes what I see in a hospital is because the hospital is not wanting on their dashboard, 
deaths that occur in the hospital, they'll say, well, we'll make a referral to hospice. And then we're, before we you know, do that, we're going to discontinue all the IVs, we're going to discontinue all sub-Q, we're going to pull the feeding tubes, and now we're just going to leave them in this room and hospice will care for them under GIP. Really? Hmm. Active dying isn't a reason for GIP. It doesn't mean the person can't stay there, but we can't bill Medicare if it's not meeting the standards for GIP. So we want to think about the words we're using, which I've given you examples in your handout. Well, guess who is also watching this? You can look at this in more detail, but the OIG in 2012 said, wow, 69% of persons uh, we were paying out $254 million for GIP set, stays, and 31% was inappropriate. 268 million, 20% saying that the, the GIP, you know, wasn't really needed for that beneficiary. And 1%, there was no evidence that the beneficiary was even enrolled in hospice. So you might take a look at this, and these numbers are real. Then we look at respite care. How do we need to document? We need to document that it was for the relief of the caregiver. And respite care may be provided more than once in a certification period. That's an old myth. It's never been the case. But we really need to document why it is on an occasional basis that somebody would need respite. And my contingency is we don't use this enough. Maybe it's offered, but we don't use it enough. And this might be the best way for that caregiver to experience some relief and we want to document the discharge planning that we're putting into process to return them to their home again. So we want to also document good grief, all the medications um, that we're covering under, you know, we've got that, you know, Part D portion, if you will. So we're constantly looking at the medications. What are we covering? The therapies, the interventions, the labs, the x-ray. What kind of DME are we covering? Are we increasing the number of DME pieces of equipment in the home? Are we removing some, et cetera? Again, it's all part of documentation. Here's a note that was written on a physician's plan of care that I actually pulled. It stated this, patient is doing well, vital signs are stable, able to ambulate, appetite good, maintaining weight, complaints of nausea have been relieved. Seriously, CMS is gonna look at that and say, wow, why is this person in hospice? The important data that was omitted is listed below. You know what? We didn't talk about the PR and pain medications had been increased and we had to increase medications for nausea and that's why they're eating better, et cetera. So we do wanna step back and really say, how are we documenting? And uh, it's just an encouragement for us to do a better job. So step one, I'm gonna suggest I'm going to go back one. We really need to look at what it is that, how we're educating our staff. Are we using something such as S-bar? Are we using soap or soapy or DAP or DAR? Think about the ways in which you're structuring your narrative that then leads your clinicians to chart accordingly and practice it with them. And I'm going to suggest give them some samples in ways they can document. Step two is to educate our team on the symptoms of the disease and the prognosis. If they aren't familiar with the hospice eligibility criteria in regards to a terminal, you know, the prognostic indicators, the LCDs, how in the world are they going to look at ways to document? So for example, something, you know, if we have a patient with dementia and debility, I know we can't use that for a primary diagnosis, but we certainly can for a secondary. What does end-stage organ failure look like? If in fact somebody is referred for end-stage renal disease, what might we think the patient feels like? Wouldn't they have increased fatigue? Are we gonna look for perhaps at end of life some itchiness? Are we gonna look for you know, changes in their urine output? Are we gonna, what are they eating? Are they on a special diet? Are they able to be adherent to it? Are they tolerating? Are they developing nausea, vomiting? Do they have ascites that we need to be measuring and documenting? So again, I think at your IDT meetings, it's a great chance and a reminder for you to say, let's just do a five minutes, five minute education on, as an example, dementias. All dementias are not equal. For example, the Alzheimer's dementia we should be using the FAST assessment tool because 
from a linear standpoint, the Alzheimer's patient does tend to go from a 7, A, B, C, D, et cetera, in their decline. That is not true for a Lewy body diagnosis or a vascular dementia or for frontal lobe or for organic brain. For example, our Lewy body folks, they might not decline in that same fashion. So what do we think about our assessment tool? Maybe we want to use the GDS, the Global Deterioration Assessment Tool. And when we think about Lewy body, we think about, wow, an increased evidence of falls, falls typically to the back, falling backwards. We think about orthostatic hypotension. We think about hallucinations. So again, if I know what to look for, perhaps I'm charting accordingly. And here's just an insert for you as we talked about the FAST functional scale. How do I even describe what 7D looks like? Unable to sit up independently. Okay, so I'm now in a patient's room. What kind of help do they need to sit up? So here's just a note as an example, written by the chaplain to say, you know, the patient smiled and greeted the chaplain. They talked about her husband and family while holding the chaplain's hand. Uh, chaplain provided a ministry of presence and prayed with the patient, provided a follow-up phone call to the daughter. Well. The rest of the record reflected that the patient with this diagnosis of dementia, hopefully Alzheimer's in which we use the FAST scale, had a FAST score of 7D, which means she could not maintain posture without support. So the rest of the story is the patient was received in her wheelchair. She was leaning to the side with support pillows as the aide was completing her feeding and the patient was coughing. The care plan needs were addressed altered mental status, spiritual presence. The chaplain held her hand, encouraged eye contact, read scriptures and prayed with the patient. So it's a very different picture than what was charted initially um, that I had on that first paragraph. And so here's the rest of the story also. When the chaplain brought up the husband's name, the patient began to talk about if him if he were still alive. Excuse me, this is a different patient, but again, here's the charting although he had been deceased for years. Patient was comforted by prayer and support, et cetera. And so again, it's very descriptive. So we want to look at our objective review. Determine the assessment tools that you're going to be using and educate, educate, educate. And again, audit a part of your chart. Step back and say, if I were Medicare and I received this chart as requested, would I pay for the services? Because remember, we're all paying for the services that we feel are very important as taxpayers or as insurance holders. Analyze the data. Do I see measurable comparisons? What are the discrepancies? And by the way, you know, CMS is really looking for a discrepancy. I recently worked with an agency um, who had 40 charts requested by their MAC and they literally pulled out what the gerontologist stated in his documentation upon referral that this patient with Alzheimer's was very appropriate for admission. But then also in that clinical record was a note from one of the integrative therapists who, if you just looked at that note, it conflicted with the gerontologist. And guess what? The MAC went with the decision that they were gonna deny the claim because of what the integrative therapist had written about the patient. And of course, the hospice agency is like asking, are you kidding? We have a gerontologist who has done an assessment of the patient. And so it's been a very long process of two levels of appeal to say, you know what? You really need to pay us for this because we believe the gerontologist note has stronger weight and value in determining eligibility than an integrative therapist. And so probably in three to five years from now, that agency will, when it when their claim gets to the ALJ level, they'll be paid, but boy, is that a long time to wait. So we really think about, again, every single person is a part of our documentation, not just the nurse or the physician. It's we look at our whole entire team and how are we teaching them to document. The top denials, as was shared in our most recent MAC uh, visit, were, were, are still related around the ones I have listed here for you. The terminal prognosis was not supported. So again, I'm preaching to the choir, but I think you look at that documentation up front, even sometimes if it means waiting 
12 more hours or 24 more hours upon referral to say, I really need to see and feel and hear what it is that our medical director is going to hang his or her hat on to say this person is terminally ill. The physician narrative was not present or it was invalid. And the GIP care was not reasonable and necessary. So those are the top three denials um, at this point. So all of our documentation needs to reflect the picture of the patient, uh, without a doubt. And so I'd like to, I'm reaching the end of my PowerPoint, but I'd like to just have you pull out, if you've downloaded, a couple of the tools I've included for today's seminar. And one of them comes directly from CGS, which talks about suggestions for improved documentation. So this becomes a real good educational tool, not only on orientation of all your staff, but I think maybe it's a quarterly. You say, okay, we're gonna spend some time now talking about our documentation and literally pulling some of the records from your client agency, patient agency and say, would we pay this based on, you know, they give us some really good advice here. And our MACs are wanting us to have good documentation so that in fact they can pay our claims so we can continue doing the good work we do. I've also then included other information that I've extrapolated from several different sources that um, if it's helpful to you to think of ways you can chart. For example, our chaplains. You know, most of the time they were not taught to chart in their previous, if you will, education or perhaps our integrative therapy. So how do they chart wheelchair bound? Or how do they chart, for example, the patient is disoriented or confused or bed bound? And you can see it gives you some examples that I hope will be helpful. So for uh, here's another one. Instead of just saying the patient appears to be thin, how do we know that? Their eyes are hollow, the clothes are not fitting, the watch that fit a month ago, the band is loose, or perhaps they've gained all kinds of edema and the wife has had to cut the slippers open so they still continue to fit. How long does it take to feed somebody? How much did they eat, et cetera. And then I also have a two page, uh, if you will, document that I'd like to uh, share with you as well and give full um, benefit to uh, Dr. Willard and others. When we talk about documentation for dementia, you know, decreased uh, mental status, meal times, weight loss, ambulation, charting, you know, to the negative, et cetera. So I hope my goal is that I've given you some tools that you can go back to and to say this just becomes um, nature around here that we're going to, based on the disease and the comorbidities, these are the tools we're going to use for documentation. So with that, I know I've been talking really fast, but I hope you've stayed awake during this presentation. And I sure am open to some questions if you would have them at this time. And I can't believe that people don't have questions. And as a good hospice nurse, I am comfortable with your silence for just a bit as you think about typing in a question you may have on your uh, go to webinar control panel. I'm not hearing any questions right now, but I want to reemphasize perhaps a couple of things that I, I talked about very quickly. When I have met with hospice agencies, I have asked them, do you use and uh, refer to PTOT or speech? And sometimes I hear, well, we have a contract, but we never use them because that doesn't fit with hospice. And I would like to suggest to you rethink that. They can be extremely valuable for our hospice patient and for our family. So um, think about how you can have them come in and do an in-service for you. And also, they have to relearn how to chart because you don't want them charting in the same way they do for uh, you know, documentation of you know, improvement you want to think about the decline as well. So I do see we have a couple of questions. A question is, is it okay to admit directly to respite care from the hospital due to either lack of caregiver or the caregiver is fatigued? My response would be this, no and yes. To admit directly to respite from hospital 
If there is no caregiver, the answer is no, because respite is for the relief of a caregiver. If the caregiver, if there's documentation that the caregiver is fatigued and not yet ready to have that person come home, that would seem to be appropriate with your good documentation, but not to keep somebody in a holding place or a holding pattern when there is no caregiver. No, that would not be an appropriate use of respite care. And by the way, my email is on here, and if you have additional questions, uh, you can feel free to send the question in to Healthcare First, and they will forward that to me. So I have another question. Do I have suggestions to help staff get excited about improving documentation? Oh, that's a great question. I think uh, maybe if you can use really good examples. Uh, first of all, we don't ever want to diminish people's really good work. But I think if you can hold out those people that are doing a great job, um, perhaps also doing some mentoring, uh, some preceptor kinds of things. You know, we give a lot of resources to our folks to learn how to do pain management. Uh, we want to do that for documentation. And also, I think to kind of personalize it by saying, you guys, if we really believe in what we're doing, we have to prove it. And do you know what? If we were paying the bill, would we pay for what it is that we're doing? And not, not too many people want to hear about money. But I, I think sort of, can you make it fun in regards to it's a competition? You know, who's the most timely, who's the most succinct, uh, you know, can we honor the best practice? And chocolate always works well, too. So if, if you want to think about that. And you know what? Maybe just asking a simple question, what would get you guys excited about this? There's not a nurse I have heard of that is excited about documentation, nor a social worker, et cetera. Another question, do you see much utilization of a registered dietitian? Yes and no. And I think it'd be, while we don't have to, quote, have a registered dietitian to provide the nutritional counseling, I think it can be extremely beneficial. From an education to our staff, perhaps even consultation in ways in which we can make the dietary experience the most meaningful for the patient and also provide some reinforcement for that patient's family. And when we get into the tube feeding issue, et cetera, um, you know, and are there foods that are appropriate? Should they be thickened? Should they not? I think it can be extremely beneficial. And again, it's an intervention. And you are pulling forth the best possible resource. I'm certainly not a registered dietitian. I know a little bit. But, you know, in those situations in which they could provide expertise, absolutely could be beneficial. And I think with all the allergies that we have and the sensitivities in diet, they can also give you some really good guidance, quick upfront center to help you along as well. Okay, I'm going to see if I have another question here. Do I anticipate CMS paying or withholding payment to hospices based on the quality of their documentation? Absolutely. If our documentation doesn't support eligibility, if our documentation does not support the use of GIP or continuous care, absolutely they're going to deny a claim. And so again, if I think, and this might be an educational piece for your, all of your staff, to just help them understand what CMS does see from your agency upon your hospice admission. You know, they're getting a billing, they're getting a you know, a code, they're getting, you know, you're recording all the medications, all the durable medical equipment, they're looking at your HIS, they're looking at your timeliness, when are you filing your, you know, election of benefit, your revocation, your discharge, your levels of care, they're getting all that data. They're not seeing the charting until they request your documentation. That is when they're denying beyond technicalities. They're denying based on your lack of quality of documentation. Absolutely. And as we know, we're SOL. If they don't pay us, we can't go back and bill the patient or the family. We have to absorb that because it really is the hospice's discretion as to whether this person meets eligibility or not. So that, I believe, is the end of the questions right now, and it is promptly three. So I'm going to turn it back to either Julia or Megan 
uh, for any final comments they may have on this webinar, I just want to thank the 114 and 15 of the sites that joined today and took time out of your busy day. So back to the Healthcare First staff. Thank you so much, Loris. That was great information. Um, on the next slide, I just want to briefly touch upon a few product enhancement projects that we have completed for First Hospice, our hospice EHR software. And what we are working on to close out the year. We set a number of initiatives in 2017 to proactively address the growing needs of our customers to increase profit margins, improve quality of care, and effectively address compliance requirements and increased transparency into quality. So, as you can see here, we have partnered with a number of hospice industry leaders to offer some new exciting interfaces in first hospice for DME and medical supply management, pharmacy management, and all payer revenue cycle management. Additionally, we have completed several new enhancements to first hospice, including a new user interface with a clean, modern aesthetic, new icons, and expansive work screens. All of this enhances the ease of use of the software. We also introduced NOE Link in First Hospice. NOE Link provides a comprehensive workflow for managing NOE submissions. You can easily create an NOE for an individual patient or for a batch of patients, validate that the required elements have been completed, and submit to CMS without ever having to leave your software. And last but not least, soon we will be releasing CarePliance care planning technology for First Hospice. CarePliance is a thoughtfully designed clinical workflow that follows standard patient care processes, directing focus, focus on patients and not documentation. Your clinicians are equipped with the most thorough evidence-based guidance available to reinforce sound decisions at the point of care, resulting in consistent clinical documentation that ensures compliance, minimizing the risks of audits, denials, and take backs. If you're interested in learning more about what First Hospice has in store, I invite you to attend one of our Solutions Spotlight webinars, as you see on the screen here. Uh, these are 30-minute webinars and are a great way to get a quick look at First Hospice and how it can help your hospice. To register, you just need to visit www.healthcarefirst.com slash webinars, and our first Solutions Spotlight webinar will be tomorrow, so we hope that you all will join us. That concludes today's presentation. As a reminder, the webinar recording as well as the handout for this webinar will be made available on our website in the next week or so and distributed to you all. Lastly, as you log out of this webinar, you will see a survey pop up asking for feedback on today's presentation. We ask that you please fill out this survey as your feedback is very important to us when planning future online events. You can also use the survey to let us know if you're interested in having a Healthcare First representative contact you about our products and services. On behalf of Loris and the entire team here at Healthcare First, we just want to thank you for joining us today and we hope that you will join us again for more webinars in the future. Have a great afternoon.